Good evening, good evening, and welcome you to our uh, Bible study here at Sierra North Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, we're picking up where we left off last week on the uh, Sabbath versus Sunday debate, and we're going to go ahead and just jump right in it. So I ask uh, Reverend Legister, if you can open us in a word of prayer, please. Let us pray. God, our loving Father, we thank you for the privilege extended to us to meet like this, to get into your word to seek to understand what it says to us so that we can be better disciples of yours. We thank you for our teacher, Reverend Chisholm, and we ask your blessings upon him in a very special way. And as he struggled with his sight, we ask that, Lord, you, by your power, uh, would work a miracle on him to restore the, 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 the sight so that he can see and carry on the work that you have entrusted to him. We ask that you would bless us as we come now to look into your word and guide and direct us so that uh, our minds, our hearts, our understanding will be clear and we will reap what is there for us to nourish our souls. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. All right. Um, everybody here knows the rules, so we'll uh, go ahead and continue on. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, just to remind everybody, Saturday, God willing, the 28th of October, we will be having our fall festival as, at the church starting at noon, 12 uh, p.m. and going to 5 p.m. Um, come on out, have fun. It's not just for the kids, it's for everyone. Um, uh, if you have um, candy or little drinks and stuff you'd like to donate, you can drop them by uh, the church office or bring them with you on Saturday. If you'd like to volunteer as well, um, that opportunity will be there for you um, too. All right. And um, with that, we'll go ahead and jump into our study for tonight. As I said before, we're going to be continuing with the Sabbath versus Sunday uh, debate. Um, it should be, it was pre-recorded by Reverend Chisholm and he's here with us um, on the line here with, with us. So uh, we're going to play um, the video, uh, the audio, and any questions or comments, he's here to be able to uh, answer answer them as we go along. All right, let's set this up. Another very important teaching block of scripture on the Christian's relationship with the law is the epistle to the Galatians. For a fuller treatment of this epistle, I would recommend my three-part cassette series, The Christian and the Mosaic Law. Let me share some of the main insights that this epistle offers for our discussion. But first, a bit of background information. The problem that is being dealt with in the epistle is the problem of the place of the Mosaic law in attaining and maintaining special and sufficient spiritual status before God. The text of the epistle indicates that there was an influential group of people led by a prestigious ringleader who were teaching that to be right with God, one had to keep the Mosaic law and be circumcised. From what we said earlier about the Sinaitic Covenant, you can appreciate why these people were insisting on the need to keep the law and be circumcised. These were essential requirements under, under the Sinaitic or Old Covenant. In Galatians 1, 8 to 9, Paul denounces the call to keep the law and be circumcised and regards such a teaching as a perversion of the gospel. In fact, he pronounces a curse upon those involved in this perversion of the gospel. Paul was saying in effect, the gospel which I preach to you is the standard, the gauge, the yardstick, accept nothing else. What is of critical importance is the point Paul made in Galatians 2 and verse 2 and 7 
to 9 that the content of the gospel he was preaching had the approval of Peter, James, and John. Understandably then, in the later portion of Galatians 2, Paul relates two things. One, his denunciation of Peter, and two, his defense of the gospel. Paul's denunciation of Peter was in public. But what was the situation that caused this public rebuke of a senior apostle? Galatians 2, 12 to 13 explain. Peter, though a Jew, normally and correctly ate with his Gentile brethren, thereby setting aside Jewish dietary restrictions found in the Mosaic law. When the Orthodox Jews came from James, presumably from Jerusalem, Peter stopped eating with the Gentiles for fear of the Orthodox Jews. And as verse 13 says, Barnabas and other Jews followed Peter's hypocritical behavior. According to Galatians 2.14, Paul saw that the truth of the gospel was at stake, and so he rebuked Peter publicly. Paul was saying to Peter, in essence, live what you preach, and preach what you live. Normally and correctly, you live like the Gentiles, free from the law. Why then, by your present behavior, are you suggesting that Gentiles live as Jews? There is a signal lesson that we dare not miss here. It is this. This rebuke is happening after Calvary, and Jewish dietary laws integral parts of the Mosaic law were still being observed by Christian Jews. It is important then to point out that the continuance of a practice after Calvary, be it Sabbath keeping, circumcision, or heeding dietary laws, does not of itself prove that the practice is necessary for or binding on Christians. In Galatians 2.15 and following, Paul states a theological principle which was absolutely fundamental and central to the whole argument in the epistle. Listen to that section from the New International Version. Quote, We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law no one will be justified." Unquote. Let me retranslate that and amplify the reading somewhat to reinforce this crucial theological principle. Quote, we as born and bred Jews, knowing that attaining spiritual status before God comes not by obedience to the law, not by circumcision, nor by heeding dietary restrictions, nor by keeping special days, months, years, or times, but by faith in Jesus, even we Jews believed in Jesus so that we might attain spiritual status with God." Unquote. Galatians 2, 17 to 19 are difficult verses, but some basic understanding of these verses is necessary. In these verses, Paul implicitly deals with a thought that could be in the mind of an Orthodox Jew. It seems that for the Orthodox Jew, a gospel of salvation or justification by grace through faith in Jesus would not only remove incentive for moral effort, but could lead to lower moral standards than under the law of Moses. Thus Christ would be aiding and abetting sin. Paul rejects that line of reasoning and argues that if sin is found in the life of the one justified by faith, the conclusion to be drawn is not that Christ caused the sin, 
And the option then would not be to rebuild the system of law keeping to be justified. Since the one who has been justified ceases to live in that world where the law is dominant. As he says in verse 19, quote, I died to the law that I might live to God, that is live under the control of God for the honor of God, unquote. The ever popular verse 20 must be read, quote, I have been crucified with Christ, unquote, not I am crucified with Christ. The point here is that Paul and all believers in Jesus judicially died with Christ. And it is that identification with Christ's death through faith that places the believer in a new sphere and in a new relationship with God. Watch now the concluding thrust of chapter 2 in verse 21. This verse is insightful. Listen to it from today's English version. Quote, if a man is put right with God through the law, it means that Christ died for nothing, unquote. Let me say it another way. If special status, spiritual status, special standing comes through the law, Jesus Christ died in vain. If one could attain special and sufficient spiritual status and standing through circumcision, dietary laws, and Sabbath keeping, all works of the law, then the death of Christ was a grand waste of time. In Galatians 3, Paul continues his theological argument to show the Galatians that the law is not necessary for special and sufficient spiritual status or standing before God. In this chapter, Paul draws on the experience of the Galatians and the experience of Abraham to prove his point. Paul challenges the Galatians to remember that they received the Spirit and had miracles done in their midst by faith in Jesus, not by keeping the law. Similarly, Abraham put faith in God and received spiritual status and standing with God. The thrust of Galatians 3 up to verse 14 is this. God intended that all receive special and sufficient spiritual status on the basis of faith. Old Testament scripture predicted that the Gentiles would receive the inheritance of Abraham on the basis of faith. The death of Christ was for the purpose of making this special spiritual status available to Gentiles especially on the basis of faith. In verses 15 to 18 of chapter 3, the issue is the tension between the Mosaic law and the Abrahamic promise. Because someone might say to Paul, okay, what you have said about the promise to Abraham and the cruciality of faith to that promise is correct. But that was the arrangement before the law came. Now that the law has come, it has annulled or added to that arrangement. Paul anticipates and deals with such an objection. So in verse 15, Paul takes the case of a legal contract, a person's agreed on, signed and sealed contract. No one, he says, can alter this contract except the party or parties who effected the agreement. The contract cannot be annulled or added to by anyone else. The point of verse 16 is that God ratified a covenant or promise with Abraham and his seed, Jesus Christ. With deep spiritual insight on the Abrahamic promise or covenant, Paul was saying, even though the promise was made before Christ, its fulfillment was in Christ. So that in spite of the covenant's age, and in spite of all that happened over the centuries, that covenant still stands ratified and the Mosaic law, which came between the promise and its fulfillment, cannot and does not annul the covenant and therefore cannot 
and does not affect or alter the promise. That's the force of verse 17. Now verse 18 adds that if the blessing through Abraham's seed depended on the Mosaic law, then it would not be based on promise. But God had said the inheritance would be based on the promise. Having argued that inheritance does not come by law, Paul raises a crucial question in verse 19, a question that an Orthodox Jew listening to Paul's argument would have asked. Why then did God give the law? What is its purpose? Since the law cannot save, cannot give special and sufficient spiritual status before God, what then is the law's purpose? Paul answers in verse 19. The law was given because of transgressions, that is, to reveal the evil of transgressions, or to make wrongdoing a legal offense, or to regulate moral conduct till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the law had a purpose for a stated duration, for a specified period of time. Never miss that. And let no modern law keeper lead you to overlook or gloss over that fact. Who is the seed to whom the promise was made? Jesus Christ. So then, the law was given to regulate moral conduct up to and until Christ's death on the cross. See verses 13 to 14 as well. The force of Paul's teaching here is that Calvary brought the law to a head and to its end. Its job having been completed there, it became redundant. Paul will make the same point by describing the law in other terms, but always description and duration go together. So another key question comes in verse 21. Is the law then essentially contrary to the promises of God? Paul answers in verses 21 and 22. And I like the answer as it is translated in the Jerusalem Bible. It reads, quote, Of course not. We could have been justified by the law if the law we were given had been capable of giving life. But it is not. Scripture makes no exceptions when it says that sin is master everywhere. In this way, the promise can only be given through faith in Jesus Christ and can only be given to those who have this faith." Unquote. Watch this now, verse 23 and onward. Prior to the coming of faith, or the event of Calvary, the Mosaic law had a job and did it well for the stated period. So we learn that the law was a restrainer until faith. In verse 24, the law is described as a custodian until Christ, to bring us to Christ, so that in Christ we might be justified or receive special spiritual status. Verse 25 is so clear in what it says and suggests that it is a major mystery that modern law keepers miss the truth this verse teaches. The law is described as a slave guide. That's the meaning of the word translated as schoolmaster in the King James Version. In Paul's time, the slave guide had moral jurisdiction over young children and would often lead the child to school. Verse 25 says, quote, Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a slave guide. Unquote. This is devastatingly clear. The job and jurisdiction of the slave guide ends once faith arrives. The slave guide leads to Christ so that we would be set right with God by faith. The Mosaic Law's job as a restrainer, as a custodian, as a slave guide ended at Calvary when faith came where Christ was setting people right with God by faith. 
But why is it that we who are in Christ by faith are no longer under the custodian, the slave guide? The summary answer from Galatians 3.26 through to chapter 4 verse 7 is that we are mature sons and heirs. We are by faith of age so that we can draw down on the legacy or the inheritance. Let me summarize then the Mosaic Law's purpose. The law was given to reveal the evil of transgressions until Christ. It was designed to regulate conduct until faith. It was to act as custodian or slave guide leading to Christ. The Mosaic Law was to act as a tutor and governor of spiritual minors until sonship or maturity. So in stating the purpose of the law, Paul also states the duration of the law's job. It was never God's intention for the law to provide salvation or special status before God. The law was given as a conduct regulator and infant controller until Calvary. Even though we are no longer under the law, even though we do not look to the law to regulate our conduct, it does not follow that we are free to do as we please. As Paul goes on to show in Galatians 5, we are called to a life under the guidance of the Holy Spirit who regulates our conduct and who gives the ability to live a life of holiness. Our final point from the Galatian epistle comes from that cute allegory that Paul hints at in chapter 4 and verse 21 and following. Hagar and Ishmael represent the law and its adherents, spelling spiritual bondage. Sarah and Isaac represent Christ, faith, and the promise, spelling spiritual freedom. Believers in Jesus, Paul says, are children of promise and thus free. Now please note the force of verses 28 and following. What happened in Old Testament times was happening in Galatia in the first century and is happening in the 21st century. The children of bondage putting pressure on the child of freedom. But God commanded that the son of the slave woman would not share in the inheritance of the son of the free one. The point is clear. You cannot mix the covenants because bondage and freedom cannot mix. Enjoy your freedom, Galatians 5.1 says, and do not seek to be again in bondage. The lessons we learn from Galatians should be enough to set the record straight that Christians are not required to keep any aspect of the Mosaic law. No matter how many passages from the Old Testament the modern law keeper may show you, tell that one to learn about the purpose and duration of the law through Paul. Through this born again Pharisee, we get revelation, illumination, and clarification on the purpose and duration of the law and learn of our spirit guided liberation from the law. That's the uh, first part, and we move on to the second part. Any questions? I think it's pretty clear. We'll move on to this uh, last part here. Yeah, that 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 feels pretty clear. I I um I think our seven day brethren are in trouble. Where is the brother Clint? We are there in deep waters, troublesome waters. If they try to read Galatians respect, respectfully and in text, in light of context, they would realize that they have been pressuring people who worship on a Sunday for nothing. Mm -hmm. But they, they are doing what is not required of Jew or Gentile after Calvary. And I guess that's where, too, that, that's where the... Uh, the issue is, I was going to say a mistake, but the issue is, I don't know, Reverend 
Chisholm has been clear with this is there's nothing wrong with worshiping on a Saturday. There's nothing wrong with worshiping mm -hmm. on a Sunday. It's when you now you go and you tell somebody they're going to hell because they worship on a they're Sunday. On a Saturday, right. You know, or or vice versa. You know, that's 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 the big thing where I, um I usually don't uh <laughs> It's funny with these studies. Sometimes you'll listen to some of these YouTube shorts. And they're only a minute, and you know you go through. Uh, there was this young guy giving a, a message on these sh shorts, and he's talking how uh, the importance of the Sabbath and how you know, and he brings in Adam and Eve. You know, and 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 they were they, you know they were around when you know this Sabbath, and you know basically saying they observed the Sabbath, Adam and Eve. Uh, I usually don't comment in these things, but this guy had no comments. He just wasn't a popular person. And I looked down and saw he's from a seventh day. And I said, hey, you know, if you actually read through Genesis, there's no mention of Sabbath in Genesis. <laughs> you know, because uh, uh, we had just covered it. Uh, I, 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 I don't remember the guy's name. I, I may have to check my history to see if they answered back or, or something. But, you know, that's where, you know, we come here, we get this, you know, this, you know, uh, this information from the from the scripture, you know, we, we you're a little more confident in answering back some of these people when you know they try to, you know, put things out there and call it, them, you know, gospel. You know, it seemed to me like it's 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 a kind of cop out to um, make those feel that they they can kind of just live anyway, uh, you know, as long as they keep the Sabbath. Uh, and, yeah. and stuff like that, which which is a false doctrine, uh, yeah, you know. It is the be all and the end all for most of them who are yeah. sabbatarian. That's Even right. How else are you living? Not important for many of them. Maybe most of them. Hmm. That that's a serious thing, and and um, uh, I, I I guess. I guess God is going to flog them in the appropriate time because they are leading people astray. They are making people think that uh, um, their religion or, or their being right with God is their observance of, of one in particular thing, and that is the Sabbath and, and um, that kind of stuff. When, when in truth, it, it, there, it says there's no, no salvation but in Christ. And, you know, I get that, too. And, you know, I guess there's people who push back, and especially now with this war going on, same, you know, talk about the covenant, uh, you know, like you rightly said that, you know, those who are getting into heaven are those who accept Jesus Christ as, as Lord and sa Savior. Um, whether you're a Jew or Gentile. Yeah, whether, whether or not. Not just because you're in the country of Israel means you're going to get in, you know, just wholeheartedly you know uh you you still as an individual have to make that that uh that uh personal commitment yeah personal commitment that genuine the genuine acceptance of Jesus Christ as the lord and savior uh just because your name Jude don't mean how right you're true you know so people are still kind of holding on to that like uh, as you said that it's a mosaic law and it's this covenant and you know this is what we've done even though that was done with when uh, Jesus died on the cross, but 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 I I, I still reiterate what um Laurentism said that you know if you want to keep you want to keep the Sabbath uh, uh, you know as a day of worship or whatever that's fine but um when you when you make it to come in in on the same plane as what Jesus Christ did for us then you know. We are missing the boat altogether. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because you know, people people do that. They go around and say, "Well, you worship on a Sunday, you're going to hell. You have to worship on a Saturday." You know, I I, Saturday. I think that I think that for them that is that is easier easier than anything else. A cop out. Well, I, I worship on on the Sabbath. I'm keeping um, the law, but um, they, they they just draw a big line across grace. Yeah. I, I'm I'm more right and more pious than you and more holy than you. Yeah, yeah. All right, you have one more. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do this one. Share. Yeah.
The epistle to the Romans also sheds light on the Sinaitic covenant and teaches that nothing in that covenant is commanded for Christians today. Romans 3 and 4 provide ample evidence that God does not expect or require Christians today to be guided by the Sinaitic covenant or the law. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul makes a point which he also made in Galatians time and again, that no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing the law. And he proceeds in the following verses to argue the same point from different angles. Technically, Paul plays with law as a principle and the Mosaic law as a specific law code. So at times, the definite article the appears. Other times, it does not. If you're technically fussy, verse 20 of chapter 3 onward should read, quote, one will not be justified before him, that is God, by works of law, for through law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God minus law has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Unquote. Paul's burden in Romans 3 and 4 is to argue that one is declared righteous simply and solely by faith in Jesus Christ, so that the Jew has no unfair advantage over the Gentile, since everyone has to come by faith. So listen to Paul in Romans 3 and verse 27 and following. Quote, Where then is the boasting? It was shut out. Through what law or principle? That of works? No, but through a law or principle of faith. For we reckon a man to be justified by faith minus works of law. Is he a God of Jews only? Not also of Gentiles? Yes, also of Gentiles. Since there is one God who justifies the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we therefore destroy law through faith? Perish the thought. Rather, we affirm or uphold law. Unquote. I confess that I remain baffled that biblically intelligent Sabbath keepers, despite such passages, continue to see the Sabbath and other trappings of the Old Covenant as required by God of Christians today. As we have said elsewhere, if one desires to keep the Sabbath, avoid certain meats, etc., that person is doing nothing wrong. But please do not say, suggest, imply, or demand that anybody else needs to do that to be right with God, for that is to tell lies on the Bible and on God. Now then, all that we have said so far should be sufficient for you to understand the fundamental issues and approach needed in resolving the Sabbath versus Sunday debate. Let me though remind you of an easily forgotten mindset. You never go to any text of the New Testament without asking questions of before Calvary or after Calvary. And you must never discuss the Sabbath by itself. The issue is the old Sinaitic covenant and the treatment of it in the New Testament. So as I said earlier, the mistake that most Sabbath keepers make and which those who observe Sunday allow them to get away with is the mistake of thinking about one part of the Sinaitic covenant instead of examining the treatment of the covenant itself, the covenant as a whole in the New Testament. Sabbath dietary laws, civil regulations, moral statutes, if they are part and parcel of the Sinaitic Covenant, hang together, and whatever happens to the Covenant itself logically happens to them as elements of that Covenant. It is important to remember as well that the continuance of a practice after Calvary, be it Sabbath keeping, circumcision, or heeding dietary laws, does not of itself prove that the practice is necessary for or binding on Christians. 
Let us now give attention to some side issues that get on due prominence in the Sabbath versus Sunday debate. You may have heard talk about Constantine or the Roman Catholic Church having changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Now before providing some historical tidbits, let me say that based on the witness of the New Testament concerning the non-necessity of observing the Sinaitic Covenant, it follows that there is no mandated day of worship as far as the New Testament is concerned. The day on which anyone worships is neither here nor there with God. Look at Romans 14, 5 to 6. The issue really is, have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? And are you walking in holiness? Now to the historical issues. By the beginning of the second century AD, Sunday observance was a universal custom in Christendom. The only exception was a small group of Jewish Christians called Ebionites, and they observed both Saturday and Sunday. A few quotations from Christian literature of the second century AD should help to clarify the situation. From the Epistle of Barnabas, roughly AD 120, quote, Wherefore, also, we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day also on which Jesus rose from the dead, unquote. From the Epistle of Ignatius, roughly AD 115, quote, Be not deceived with strange doctrines, nor with old fables which are unf unprofitable, for if we still live according to the Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in the observance of the Lord's day." Unquote. From the writings of Justin Martyr, approximately AD 140, quote, And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together in one place. Sunday is the day on which we all hold a common assembly." Unquote. Now, if by the beginning of the second century, Sunday observance was the universal Christian practice without any record of disagreement or dissent, it is more than likely that Sunday observance was already the custom in the first century in Palestine and spread to Gentile territories by the missionaries from Palestine. We must bear in mind that such a universal practice would take quite a while to become so settled a tradition. It must be remembered as well that Jewish Christians in Palestine and elsewhere continued to observe the Sabbath and attend the temple, at least up to its destruction in AD 70, and synagogue services but they also met as Christians in private homes to hear the teaching from the apostles and to break bread together. It is very likely that as 1 Corinthians 16, 2 and Acts 27 imply, these other meetings were on Sundays. The prominence of the first day of the week in the gospel accounts of the resurrection and post-resurrection appearances of our Lord. See Matthew 28, 1, Mark 16, 1 to 2, Luke 24, 1, and John 21, 19 and 26, would no doubt have influenced the importance of Sunday as a day for Christian worship. Of special importance too would be the fact that the church was born on the day of Pentecost, a Sunday. The allegation that the Roman Catholic Church changed the Sabbath to Sunday in the second century AD is devoid of evidence. Please know that there was no Roman Catholic Church in the second century, and no church of that period had sufficient authority to change the weekly day of worship throughout Christendom. In fact, the church in Rome not to be confused with the later Roman Catholic Church, was unsuccessful in promoting fasting on Sundays. Bishop Victor of Rome, as late as the end of the second century AD, attempted to change the quarter decimon churches 
to the observance of the Sunday Easter. There was stubborn resistance to this move in Asia because the quarter decimal churches, as their name suggests, kept Easter at the same time as the Jewish Passover, 14th Nisan, on whichever day it falls. Irenaeus, another prominent church father, and others were shocked and saw Bishop Victor's attempt as autocratic and offensive. Before we leave this issue, let me say that some Sabbath keepers will point to quotations from Roman Catholic sources that indicate a belief within Roman Catholic circles that the Catholic Church changed the Sabbath to Sunday. Whenever you are shown such quotations, probe the date when the alleged or admitted change was done by the Roman Catholic Church. Any such date would have to be long after the second century AD and thus is beside the point because already by the beginning of the second century the historical records reveal Sunday as the universal day of worship for Christians. Further, no one can really change the Sabbath. So despite what the Catholics or any other group may claim, the Sabbath is Saturday. The real issue is whether God still demands adherence to the Sinaitic Covenant with its requirement of keeping the Sabbath. The claim that Emperor Constantine changed the Sabbath to Sunday is misinformed. On the 3rd of March, 321 AD, Constantine passed a law declaring total rest from work on Sunday, the most honorable day of the sun. Only farmers were exempt. Even though the law benefited Christians, and even though Constantine was sympathetic to Christianity, the law was neither a church move nor a Christian move, but was dictated by Constantine's reverence for the sun. Henry Chadwick, on page 128 of his book, The Early Church, sums up the matter thus, quote, An inscription found near Zagreb records that Constantine changed the old custom of working for seven days and holding a market day every eighth, directing farmers to hold their market day each Sunday. This is the earliest evidence for the process by which Sunday became not merely the day on which Christians met for worship, but also a day of rest. And it is noteworthy that in both law and inscription, Constantine's stated motive for introducing this custom is respect for the sun." Unquote. In some Sabbatarian circles, the observance of Sunday as a day of worship is regarded as the taking of the mark of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13. The idea of some kind of mark, as in some sense indicating ownership or allegiance, was very common in the ancient world. Slaves were sometimes branded with a mark of ownership, especially if the slave had been a runaway. Such a runaway slave would be branded on the forehead with the letters F-U-G, which stood for fugitivus, Latin for runaway. There is also evidence that soldiers were branded on the hand with the name of their general, and devotees of gods with the symbol of the god whom they worshipped. To bear the mark of a person would then mean either that one belonged to that person as a slave or a soldier, or that one was devoted to that person as a worshipper to a god. The mark of the beast was a mark of allegiance on the part of those who received it and designated them as worshippers of the beast. The mark of the beast could not have been meant to indicate observance of Sunday because Consistent with what marking meant in John's time, Revelation 13 makes it quite clear that the issue is worship of the first beast or his image. Notice the frequent references to worship of the first beast in verses 4, 8, 12, and 15. That worship of the first beast is the issue in verses 12 to 18 should be understandable because the first beast seeks to replace God. He has names of blasphemy 
verse 1, speaks blasphemies against God, verse 6, wages warfare on the saints, verse 7, to ensure that all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, verse 8. The mark of the beast, therefore, served to identify those who worshipped the beast. And the mark allowed them and them alone to engage in even the simplest and most vital commercial transactions of the day. Mark of the beast is equal to worship of the beast, is equal to non-worship of God, is equal to survival. Rejection of the mark of the beast is equal to non-worship of the beast, is equal to worship of God, is equal to death. The authorized King James Version of verse 17 can be misleading. There is no or after the word mark in the original Greek. Thus, the mark of the beast is the imprinted name or its numerical equivalent. 666 or 616 as some manuscripts have it. A better translation of the verse would be, quote, save he that had the mark, even the name of the beast or the number of his name, unquote. The mark of the beast in Revelation 13 had nothing whatsoever to do with the observance of Sunday as a day of worship, but had everything to do with the refusal of Christians to participate in the rituals associated with a Roman imperial cult, which involved showing religious respect and sometimes even worshipful reverence for the emperor. It should be borne in mind that the emperor under whom John wrote was, in all likelihood, Domitian, and he, on his coins, had himself styled Lord and God. Names of blasphemy for a radical Jew or Christian. On another score, some Sabbatarians mention that Isaiah 66 indicates that the Sabbath will be kept in the new earth to come. Hence, it must still be valid and should be kept now. Well, do not overlook the fact that Isaiah's prophecy is cast in the idiom of the Old Covenant and so uses Old Covenant time markers like New Moon and Sabbath just as it also suggests the resurgence of the Levitical priesthood in verses 20 and 21. Moreover, it does not follow that what is to be in the new earth is necessarily to be happening now, because in Isaiah 65 and verse 25, which also deals with the realities in the new earth, the wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Would anyone try those things now? Finally, let me say, if you're a Sabbath keeper, bless the Lord and do what you think God demands of you. But please do not impose your practices on anyone else as a requirement from God. If you observe Sunday, then do not allow anyone to disturb your mind or your peace. Just remember the material we have shared with you here. And remind yourself of Colossians 2, 16 to 17, quote, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ, unquote. For your continued study and reflection, I would recommend two books, From Sabbath to Lord's Day, edited by D.A. Carson, and also a very important book, Sabbath in Crisis, written by Dale Ratzlaff, a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor, or the newer edition titled now Sabbath in Christ. You know, while, while we were sitting here, um, I got a little notification on my phone. That, I was just mentioning that uh, um, comment I left on the Adventist uh, 
speaker's YouTube, they actually responded and said, uh, I had mentioned, I said, you know, he's talking about Sabbath identity. And I said, interesting. So do you realize Sabbath is not mentioned anywhere in Genesis? Because Adam and Eve never observed the Sabbath. And he resp they respond, he says, while it may not have explicit, while it may not have explicitly said that Adam and Eve rested on the seventh day, the Sabbath, it does explicitly say in Genesis 2-2 two, two, that God did. That, that was yeah. his that was his yeah. <laughs> response. A very, very lame response because yeah. the fact that God rested just means God ceased to create. Right. On the day. And Adam and Eve could not have kept any Sabbath because when they were created it was just um a day before the God rested. They would have had to wait seven days to get off their first Sabbath rest. If the word is not there at all. Yeah. In the know. whole of Genesis. And some of them would say, well, the, the word rest in Hebrew sounds like the Sabbath. Oh, well, they're coming, they're related words. But the fact is that the known Sabbath is not there, and nobody in all of Genesis is commanded to observe a Sabbath rest. Nobody at all. Yeah. Because they could imitate God. God stopped creating. What would anybody, Adam or be creating to stop creating? On the, on the 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 first the first um seven day of yeah. creation. Yeah. People are just not thinking logically and thoroughly at all. No, they they it's a very lame response they gave. Yeah. And by the way, Sabbath in Christ. The former book was Sabbath in Crisis. Dale Ratzlaff and I developed a friendship over the years. And I think that book and several other Sabbath books may be available free on his website. I forgot the name of the website now, but when you Google his name, he gives away a free book. He asked myself and um, Dr. Del Palmer to assist him in revising Sabbath in Crisis to Sabbath in Christ. And he acknowledges our, our help in the forward of the book or in the, the front section of the book. And what was his name again? Dale Ratzlaff, R A T Z. R-C, American, J-L-A-F-F. Draxlaff, okay. Dale. D-A-L-E. D-A-L-E, right. And Sabbath in Christ now. Right, the latest edition is Sabbath in Christ, which Dale and I helped him to revise to that name. The first edition was Sabbath in Crisis. But there, there was no, as you said, there is no mention about the Sabbath. Uh, you know, with, with, with um, Adam and Eve, we, we we don't read anywhere where it says that that they that, rested on a Sabbath day or anything, or, or that they were required to rest on a Sabbath. That's right. They're just making things up to suit their system and their doctrine, but we have to go with the text of Scripture. Yeah, I, they fast and do Scripture. I know, and and I think I've mentioned this before, and it may be. It's a long time ago I thought of it and maybe childish. My response used to be, all right, if God, rest, God rested on the seventh day, sure. Okay? Because the Bible says so. What day was the first day? You know what I mean? Yeah. What, what, yeah. Did, did he start creating on a Tuesday? This, you know, what we call Tuesday? You know, did he start creating on a Wednesday? You know, what 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 is the seventh day? So, but, you know. It always, you know, the if and then, but, the, but, uh, well, uh, 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 naturally, so, I, I, my, my, uh, yeah, nothing special yeah. comes. But if you actually look at, you know, just like, no, but I, I like your, your response, your, the way you said, um, when we, did, we touched on it, I think in Galatians, that Genesis at all doesn't say anything about Sabbath. They're, they're, like I said, they're not, of years of history, they're not commanded, straight mention, they're not commanded at all. Where it comes for the first time in Exodus 16. Yeah. And as we explained in the other place, it was like a test run of this Sabbath commandment, part of the Mosaic covenant. Yep. All right. Uh, Dad, you have any comments? Any more questions? Anything? Um. What I really want to know about the, the seven day is um, do they actually believe that works alone 
Can't see him. You know, some of them preach the gospel, but what they do is they add the Sabbath requirement as an addition to the gospel, which is really perverting the gospel. Because that was Paul's challenge in Galatia. The Galatian church is, he was saying, you, all you need is faith in the finished work of Christ at Calvary. No addition. I guess, I guess um, that kind of teaching make it nice and easy for some people to say, uh, justify themselves by saying, well, I keep the Sabbath. And um, like, that is salvation. That's right. None of them will dare say that openly, but this is the impression they would give to some people. All they have to do is observe the Sabbath. Just yeah. matter how else I live. So, so they don't they don't have to worry about the other six days. Yeah, well, you can't do anything kind of thing. It, that's yeah. what people pervert the doctrine of um, eternal security. Mm. You say once saved, always saved, and you can live in your That's heresy. If you believe that, you're going straight to a Christless hell. But people will find the easiest um, option that comes to their mind. It's easy for them to live how they want, like you said. Right, right. But if if if, if people say that they are saved, but they live how they want to live, it, that 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 totally uh, yes, um, contrary to you know, the call to holiness, but contrary to the call to consistent living in Christ. Yeah. So they 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 think that just keeping the Sabbath is enough. So it was for yeah. salvation as far as they are concerned. And it doesn't matter how they live the other six days. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. like, like those people at wa uh, watch night service, squeezing in the church door at 11.58. Yeah. I was in there two minutes before the new year dawned. And one, and then, so and then one minute after midnight, out again. Yeah. They come to church and then they go back to a party. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Rev, you mind close us, close us, closing us out, please, in order of prayer? Sure, no problem. Our Father, we thank you again for your word of truth, life. We pray that we all might be hearers of your word and doers as well. Cause so that we might learn your word live your word, love your word, and hear that word with others who do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray these things in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Night -night. Come on, I'll right, I, right. I, um, check that, that lady tomorrow, and I'll ask her to send it to um, uh, Pastor Lawson.